What's up, guys? Welcome back to another daily Bible reading snapshot. Today, we're looking at Ezekiel 4, 5, and 6 here. And this is where we start to get into Ezekiel's pictures that he creates, that God tells him to do, that show the people the judgment of God. Specifically here in chapter 4, we see this idea where he's supposed to take a brick, lay it before him, engrave on it a city, Jerusalem, and put siege works around it, make these soldiers, like toy soldiers, all around it, and then lay on your side for a long time. It's like, okay, what in the world? What is he trying to do? What is God trying to communicate through Ezekiel? Well, very clear here that he's saying Jerusalem will be laid siege. There's going to be a siege that comes against Jerusalem. Now think in your minds, okay, we said this was 593 BC. When does that final siege take place? Well, 586 BC. So there's still some time. So Ezekiel's in exile talking about what's going to happen to Jerusalem back home, so to speak, which hadn't been completely destroyed yet. At some point in the book of Ezekiel, it will be destroyed. But it says it hasn't been destroyed. And he's saying, God's going to make sure this city is destroyed and laid siege to. But why? And then why does he lay on his left side for 390 days? And then for 40 days on his right side? Why does he do that? Well, it doesn't say in particular. He doesn't give like a very specific reason for those numbers. A lot of people look at this and say, you get 390 plus 40. What do you get? 430. He says, just like the days, so also are the years. And we see there's a connection between, okay, this, how many, this many days, that many years. What we might be seeing is some kind of allusion back to the 430 years that Israel was in bondage in Egypt. We might see that. Um, it could be something else. But the point is, God is trying to show these people Jerusalem will be destroyed. And then he says, okay, that's not the only picture. Now you need to take some bread, a small amount of bread, because just like in Jerusalem, I'm going to cut off the supply of bread. You need to take a small amount of bread and you need to um, fry it over, um, let's make a little fire and let's use, what should we use? Um, I guess let's use human poop to be the, the charcoal. Let's use that. That's what God told Ezekiel to do, to bake bread over human poop. And then Ezekiel says, I, I, oh, I don't want to do human poop, right? That would be defiling, right? Kind of like, you know, Peter in Acts 10, like, I can't eat that. I, I, I've never been defiled like that. I mean, this guy's a priest, you know, he, he, he's legit. And God says, okay, fine, take a cow dung and then bake your bread over the cow dung. Why is he doing this? And what is it communicating? All the people around him are seeing Ezekiel do this and seeing, dude, that guy's crazy. That guy's crazy. He's doing this for a year. I mean, think about how long this took. This took 430 days. That's over a year to enact this one parable, this one chapter. What's the point? Well, he's telling the people, this is going to be you guys. You people who are in Jerusalem. Remember, he's doing this to the people by the Kibar Canal. But he's trying to communicate to the broader audience of Israel, you will suffer like this. If you think people back in Jerusalem won't suffer, just know this is what's going to happen to them. They're going to bake their bread over poop one day too. They're going to be laid siege against. And the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, is going to destroy them too. Now, chapter 5, how do we know that? Well, chapter 5 goes on and says even more. He says, take your hair and uh, shave your head. Like, okay, shaving his head and his beard, what is he going to do? He's going to take half, or not half, he's going to take one third of that, of that hair, and God says, burn it. Then he takes another third of that hair, and he says, chop it up with the sword. And then the next third, just take it and, and scatter it to the wind. Well, what is that supposed to represent? He says later on, he says that what he's going to do is take one third of the people and burn them up, so to speak, by pestilence. And then he's going to take one third of the people, so to speak, and chop them up with the sword. And then one third is going to be scattered among the nations. And God is saying, this is Jerusalem, this rebellious house. This is going to take place here. God's going to give the full vent of his wrath. He will satisfy his fury. He has spoken in his jealousy, his righteous jealousy, that this is going to happen. Now, chapter 6 describes some of the reasons why. It says that these Israelites, these Judeans specifically, they are getting into a ton of idolatry. They are worshiping their gods on all the mountains and all the hills and under every green tree. And God says, I am going to destroy you. I will keep some people alive. Yes, there will be a remnant, but I want everyone to know that I am the Lord and these idols are nothing. Specifically, he says in verse 13, he says, Then you shall know that I am the Lord. When they're slain, lie amongst their idols, around their altars, on every high hill and on the mountaintops and under every green tree and under every leafy oak, wherever they have offered pleasing aromas to their idols. God says, this is how you're going to know. They're going to be a bunch of dead bodies next to their idols. That is how you will know that I am the Lord and their gods are nothing. That's a pretty graphic way for God to show that. But that's the point of Ezekiel. 
That's the point of a lot of what we read in Jeremiah and a lot of what we read in the last part of the book of Isaiah. God is saying to them, you need to give up your idols, which is an important thing for us to remember that God is jealous and he will not have us worship two things. He will not have us worship our, our culture and God. He will not have us worship our families and God. He will not have us worship our sports and God. He will not have us worship two things. He wants wholehearted devotion. That was not just true back then. It's also true right now. So as Christians, we need to remember that, that God wants our full attention and worship. Now, we're looking at Hebrews chapter 10 here, the first half of Hebrews chapter 10, which again is talking just like chapter nine about the importance of Jesus dying as a blood sacrifice for us. A lot of people today say, no, Jesus didn't die as a blood sacrifice. He just died as a good example for us. Well, the book of Hebrews would make no sense if that's the case. The book of Hebrews is very clear that Jesus offered his life and he offered it to pay for our sins. It says in verse four that it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to ever take away sins. So all those things in the Old Testament pointed forward to the reality, which is that's the one of the big themes of chapter nine and 10, that the Old Testament things were shadows of the reality, the substance that's Christ. Right, is all pointing forward to Jesus. Now, verse five talks about the things that Jesus quoted. We see Psalm chapter 40 quoted here a couple of times. And the idea is that Jesus offered himself as one sacrifice. Verse 10 says once for all, right? It was one sacrifice. But it says in the Old Testament era, you had tons of sacrifices that went on so that the people could constantly have their sins atoned for. That's not how it works with Jesus. A lot of bad theology springs up around the idea that Jesus offers himself over and over again. He does not offer himself over and over again. One payment for sin. He says he's doing that, or he did that, and he doesn't have to continually sacrifice himself because he's already paid the price. Then what's quoted here in uh, chapter uh, verse 15, 16, 17 is the idea uh, of the new covenant that's promised in Jeremiah chapter 31. We just read that recently, right? That he says, I'm gonna make a new covenant with you. I'll put my law on your hearts. I'll write it on your minds. I won't remember your sins and lawless deeds anymore. And then verse 19, therefore, now all that's true. We have confidence to draw near to God. Those Jews, they have no confidence because they're trusting the blood of bulls and goats. They have no real confidence to draw near to God. We have the blood of Jesus Christ, the son of God. Let us draw near with our hearts sprinkled clean with his blood. And our consciences, they're not defiled anymore. Our bodies, they're washed. But let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. That is one of the greatest salvation assurances that we can have. The greatest is that he who promised is faithful. Jesus Christ promised to save his people. All those who repent, and trust in him. We need to repent and trust in him. And what we can be thankful for is what Jesus did to accomplish that on our behalf. So thanks for reading. We'll see you back tomorrow for another daily Bible reading snapshot.